This is an emergency. Not long ago, we used to think of the climate crisis as a threat somewhere else, sometime in the future. Not anymore. The climate emergency is here and now. We all feel it. Summers are getting hotter and drier. And it's supercharging extreme weather events. Fires. Floods. Heat domes. Making these unnatural disasters more frequent and fierce. It is causing irreparable harm and bringing death to the people and places we love. Scientists and land defenders have been warning us for decades about climate breakdown. Caused primarily by the burning of fossil fuels. The Canadian government, in the face of this catastrophe, declared a climate emergency in 2019. But when you look at how our governments are acting, you might ask yourself, Does this feel like an emergency response? So far, we've been stuck in distracting debates about incremental change with an incoherent climate plan that has barely managed to bend the curve on our carbon pollution. We're all wrestling with the dissonance of this time. With a politics that seems unable to meet this moment. So what would it look and sound like if our leaders and institutions actually treated the climate crisis like the emergency it is? What does it mean to be in genuine emergency mode? Canada has responded to an existential threat before. During the Second World War, we mobilized society at every level to fight fascism and support our allies. We witnessed an admittedly imperfect emergency response in the first year of the COVID pandemic. And we've learned some things from this history. Both from the good and the bad. What emerges from these experiences are six markers that define what it takes to confront an emergency. These are the indicators of when the leadership of a country or province or any large institution is truly ready to tackle a civilizational threat while standing up for our basic human rights, dignity, and the planet. Marker one, spend what it takes to win. Climate action will be expensive, although not as expensive as inaction. Governments need to spend what's necessary to confront this crisis. They need to put people and the planet over profit. Canada should be spending at least 2% of its gross domestic product on tackling the climate emergency. But we aren't, not even close. Today, federal government spending on climate action and green infrastructure clocks in at roughly 0.7% of GDP. Meaning, we need to triple our climate spending to get the job done. And guess what? Doing so will create hundreds of thousands of jobs, providing security and prosperity for all, not just the wealthy few. Don't let anyone tell you we don't have the money for this essential mobilization. We live at a time of unparalleled wealth. And in such a world, austerity and claims that we have to rein in public spending are a manufactured crisis. The rich get richer and we continue to subsidize fossil fuel expansion and pump taxpayer money towards the military and weapons industry. While we may take lessons from the Second World War, we don't need guns or missiles to win this fight for our future. Marker 2. Create new institutions to get the job done. What we do need is the mass production and deployment of heat pumps, solar arrays, wind farms, electric buses, and green infrastructure like high-speed rail and an east-to-west electricity grid. The kind of things that don't just drive down emissions, but make our communities cleaner, healthier, and more connected. And we need a lot of it. Now. We don't have time to wait for private industries to step up to the task. Instead, we need to rapidly create new institutions to get the job done. Like new crown corporations, public enterprises purpose-built to meet the task at hand. Just like we did in the Second World War, when Canada created 28 crown enterprises and became the armory and breadbasket for the fight against fascism. And we need audacious new public programs like a Youth Climate Corps, a generational invitation to tens of thousands of young people to meet this moment. To spend two years getting trained up in the careers needed to protect our communities and drive down our carbon emissions. If this is an emergency, then where the hell is the grand invitation to young people to rally in our collective defense? Marker three, shift from voluntary and incentive-based policies to mandatory measures. Why are we failing to properly confront the climate emergency? Because our government's current approach is to incentivize our way to victory. 
They offer rebates and tax credits. We try to encourage and cajole businesses and households to transition off fossil fuels. And it's not working. We've been at this for decades and our emissions have barely flatlined, with still more new fossil fuel projects on the horizon. This is no way to prosecute the fight of our lives. Instead of making climate action voluntary, a government in emergency mode would make it mandatory. And not in some distant future, but now. A government in emergency mode would prohibit new buildings from tying into gas lines. They would immediately ban the advertising of fossil fuels, just like we did with something else that was killing us, cigarettes. And within the next few years, they'd make it illegal to sell new combustion-powered vehicles while ensuring there was a better alternative for us all. And we would declare with clarity and pride that we can no longer approve new fossil fuel projects as of now. Because in an emergency, we can't hope for change. We have to make change happen. Marker four, tell the truth about the severity of the crisis and communicate urgency. In frequency and in tone, in words and in actions, emergencies need to look and sound and feel like emergencies. And in the face of an existential threat, we need to honor people with the truth. During the Second World War, the best communicators walked a careful line. They were forthright about the severity of the threat while still managing to impart hope. That's the balance we need today. And in our fractured media ecosystem, lies travel faster than the truth. And most media, fail to make the connections between climate change, wildfires and floods and other unnatural disasters, and the source of it all, the burning of fossil fuels. In emergency mode, our elected leaders would speak plainly and truthfully about the extent of the crisis, but also about what needs to be done to address it. And our media, particularly our public broadcaster, would hold them and big business to account and educate people on what they need to know and what they can do. Marker five, leave no one behind. Key to any societal mobilization is social solidarity. But inequality is toxic to social solidarity. It erodes the sense that we're all in this fight together and that collectively we can prevail. That means we can't tackle the climate crisis and inequality as separate issues. The wealthier someone is, the higher their emissions. The poorer someone is, the more vulnerable they are to the impacts of the climate crisis. But it's also by linking these issues that we win. A successful mobilization requires that people make common cause across class, race, and gender. We need to ensure that there is a truly just transition, providing support for all those whose lives and livelihoods are currently tied up in the fossil fuel industry. We need a jobs guarantee so that anyone who wants one can have a good green job fighting the climate crisis. We need big, bold investments in climate infrastructure, employing hundreds of thousands of people. And just as occurred in the Second World War, we need to know that the sacrifices we are making will be worth it. That on the other side of this great transformation, there will be decent jobs, affordable housing, and a more fair and just society. Because when we are asking people to join in a great undertaking, that's how we keep everyone on the bus. Marker six, Indigenous leadership, rights and title are essential to winning. Indigenous communities are bearing the brunt of the climate emergency, just one aspect of historic and ongoing colonialism. At the same time, Indigenous communities are leading the way on climate action, about a fifth of major renewable energy projects across the country are Indigenous-led. But it's not just about Indigenous nations driving the transition. Indigenous rights and title in this country have, for generations, been systematically abused and violated. And yet, as our mainstream politics dithers and dodges on meaningful and coherent climate action, over and over again it is the assertion of Indigenous rights and title that keeps buying us time, slowing and blocking new fossil fuel projects until our politics come into compliance with climate science. That's why the climate mobilization requires that we respect Indigenous title, uphold the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and honor the right to free, prior, and informed consent. 
These six markers are what our government should be doing in the face of the climate emergency. But it's not just our governments. You can use this framework with any and all of the large institutions in your life, whether a union, a pension plan, a faith institution, a post-secondary institution, a school board, or large business. These six markers tell us when leadership is in real emergency mode. We live in challenging times. There are multiple crises. The affordability crisis, the housing crisis, the poison drug crisis, and the threat of fascism rearing its head once again. These topics tend to push climate down the priorities list and out of the spotlight. But let there be no doubt. The climate crisis, with increasing and obvious insistence and ferocity, is and will be the defining struggle of our lives. Years from now, when we look back on this time, this is the issue upon which we will all be judged. Future generations will want to know what we did to give them a fighting chance at meeting this generational challenge. Will we prevail? We cannot know. What we do know is this. We are at a crossroads moment, and we all have to decide what kind of people we want to be. The truth is, we don't know if we will win this fight, if we will rise to this challenge in time. But consider this. In the Second World War, from a population at the time of about 11 million people, over 1 million Canadians enlisted. They didn't know either if they would win. And for a few years, it wasn't looking good. Yet that generation rallied regardless. And in the process, surprised themselves by what they were capable of achieving. Not just on the battlefront, but on the home front too. That's the spirit we need today.